brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that shares your values. More information is available at CharityMobile.com. Today I have for you some of the very earliest sermons given by Pope Leo I, also known as Pope St. Leo the Great. He reigned starting at in late September of the year 440, and he's most famous possibly for having met Attila the Hun in 452, and talked him out of sacking Rome. It's kind of awesome if you think about it. But Pope Leo the Great is one of the most important popes in all of history. And here you will see something very different than what we see today. I'm giving you sermons 1 and 3 from Pope St. Leo the Great because they really show what a new pontiff looks like, one who's holy. Sermon 1 is really about a new pope expressing his sort of hope that you'll pray for him, that he won't lose his soul, essentially. And Sermon 3 is on the what looks like the one-year anniversary of his elevation to the pontificate. Both are important things to bear in mind here as you hear these things, because he is he's speaking to holiness and the need to pray for bishops. And the role of the pope is not the first among equals, as some say, but as the supreme shepherd, saying this in 440. So this is... Not something that should be controversial, but for some reason is, in some circles anyway. Pope St. Leo the Great is a pope that we should look to in our time because, again, there seems to be a distinct lack of popes worried about the salvation of souls, which you hear throughout these sermons here. So with all of that having been said, Pope St. Leo the Great, Sermon 1 of Pope St. Leo the Great, given upon his elevation to the papacy. Let my mouth speak the praise of the Lord, and my breath and spirit, my flesh and tongue, bless his holy name. For it is a sign, not of a modest but an ungrateful mind, to keep silence on the kindnesses of God. And it is very meet to begin our duty as consecrated pontiff with the sacrifices of the Lord's praise. Because in our humility, the Lord has been mindful of us and has blessed us, because he alone has done great wonders for me so that your holy affection for me reckoned me present, though my long journey had forced me to be absent. Therefore I give and always shall give thanks to our God for all the things with which he has recompensed me. Your favorable opinion also I acknowledge publicly, paying you the thanks I owe, and thus showing that I understand how much respect, love, and fidelity your affectionate zeal could expend on me who long with the shepherd's anxiety for the safety of your souls who have passed so conscientious a judgment on me, with absolutely no deserts of mine to guide you. I entreat you, therefore, by the mercies of the Lord, and with your prayers with him whom you have sought out by your supplications, that both the Spirit of grace may abide in me, and that your judgment may not change. May he who inspired you with such unanimity of purpose vouchsafe to us all in common the blessing of peace." So that all the days of my life, being ready for the service of Almighty God and for my duties toward you, I may with confidence entreat with the Lord. Holy Father, keep in your name those whom you have given me. See John chapter 17, verse 11. And while you ever go on unto salvation, may my soul magnify the Lord. See Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And in the retribution of the judgment to come, may the account of my priesthood so be rendered to the just judge that through your good deeds you may be my joy and my crown, who by your good will have given an earnest testimony to me in this present life. And now Sermon 3, which was given on his birthday, delivered on the anniversary of his elevation to to the papacy. As often as God's mercy deigns to bring about around the day of his gifts to us, there is, dearly beloved, just and reasonable cause for rejoicing. If only our appointment to the office be referred to the praise of him who gave it. For though this recognition of God may well be found in all his priests, yet I take it to be peculiarly binding on me, who, regarding my own utter insignificance and the greatness of the office undertaken, ought myself also to utter the exclamation of the prophet, Lord, I heard your speech and was afraid. I considered your works and was dismayed. For what is so unwanted and so dismaying as labor to the frail, exaltation to the humble, dignity to the undeserving? And yet we do not despair nor lose heart, because we put our trust in ourselves, 
not in ourselves, but in him who works in us. And hence also we have sung with harmonious voice the psalm of David, dearly beloved, not in our own praise, but to the glory of Christ the Lord. For it is he of whom it is prophetically written, You are priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That is, not after the order of Aaron, whose priesthood descending along his own line of offspring was a temporal ministry, and ceased with the law of the Old Testament, but after the order of Melchizedek, in whom was prefigured the eternal high priest. And no reference is made to his parentage, because in him it is understood that he was portrayed, whose generation cannot be declared. And finally, now that the mystery of this divine priesthood has descended to human agency, it runs not by the line of birth, nor is that which flesh and blood created, chosen, but without regard to the privilege of paternity and succession by inheritance. Those men are received by the church as its rulers whom the Holy Ghost prepares, so that in the people of God's adoption, the whole body of which is priestly and royal, it is not the prerogative of earthly origin which obtains the unction, but the condescension of divine grace which creates the bishop. Although, therefore, dearly beloved, we be found both weak and slothful in fulfilling the duties of our office, because whatever devoted and vigorous action we desire to do, we are hindered by the frailty of our very condition. Yet having the unceasing propitiation of the Almighty and the perpetual priest, who being like us and yet equal with the Father, brought down his Godhead even to things human, and raised his manhood even to things divine, we worthily and piously rejoice over his dispensation. Whereby, though he has delegated the care of his sheep to many shepherds, yet he has not himself abandoned the guardianship of his beloved flock. And from his overruling and eternal protection, we have received the support of the apostles' aid also, which assuredly does not cease from its operation. And the strength of the foundation, on which the whole superstructure of the church is reared, is not weakened by the weight of the temple that rests upon it. For the solidity of that faith which was praised in the chief of the apostles is perpetual, and as that remains which Peter believed in Christ, so that remains which Christ instituted in Peter. For when, as it has been read in the gospel lesson, the Lord had asked the disciples whom they believed him to be amid the various opinions that were held, and the blessed Peter had replied, saying, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Lord says. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and flood have not revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be also loosed in heaven. The dispensation of truth therefore abides, and the blessed Peter, persevering in the strength of the rock which he has received, has not abandoned the helm of the church, which he undertook. For he was ordained before the rest in such a way that from his being called the rock, from his being pronounced the foundation, from his being constituted the doorkeeper of the kingdom of heaven, from his being set as the umpire to bind and loose whose judgments shall retain their validity in heaven, from all these mystical titles we might know the nature of his association with Christ. And still today he may more fully and effectually perform what is entrusted to him, and carries out every part of his duty, and charge in him and with him through whom he has been glorified. And so if anything is rightly done and rightly decreed by us, if anything is won from the mercy of God by our daily supplications, it is of his work and merits whose power lives and whose authority prevails in his see. For his dearly beloved was gained by that confession, which, inspired in the apostle's heart by God the Father, transcended all the uncertainty of human opinions, and was endued with the firmness of a rock, which no assaults could shake, for throughout the church, Peter daily says, you are, the son, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And every tongue which confesses the Lord, accepts the instruction of his voice, conveys. This faith conquers the devil and breaks the bonds of his prisoners. It uproots us from this earth and plants us in heaven, and the gates of Hades cannot prevail against it. For with such solidity is endued by God the depravity of heretics, cannot mar it nor the unbelief of the heathen overcome it. And so, dearly beloved, with reasonable obedience, we celebrate today's festival by such methods, that in my humble person he may be recognized and honored, in whom abides the care of all the shepherds, together with the charge of the sheep commended to him, and whose dignity is not abated even in so unworthy an heir. And hence, with the presence of my venerable brothers and fellow priests, so much desired and valued by me, will be the more sacred and precious, if they will transfer the chief honor of this service, in which they have deigned to take part in him, by whom they know to be not only the patron of this see, but also the primate of all bishops. When, therefore, we utter our exhortations in your ears, 
Holy brethren, believe that he is speaking whose presence we are, because it is his warning that we give, nothing else but his teaching that we preach, beseeching you to gird up the loins of your mind and lead a chaste and sober life in the fear of God, and not to let your mind forget his supremacy and consent to the lusts of the flesh. Short and fleeting are the joys of the world's pleasures which endeavor to turn aside from the path of life those who are called to eternity. The faithful and religious spirit, therefore, must desire the things which are heavenly, and being eager for the divine promises, lift itself to the love of the incorruptible good and the hope of the true light. But be sure, dearly beloved, that you labor, whereby you rest vices and fight against carnal desires, is pleasing and precious in God's sight, and in God's mercy will profit not only yourself, but me also, because the zealous pastor makes his boast of the progress of the Lord's flock. For you are my crown and joy, as the apostle says. If your faith from which the beginning of the gospel has been preached in all the world has continued in love and holiness. For though the whole church, which is in all the world, ought to abound in all virtues, yet you especially above all people becomes to excel in deeds of piety, because founded as you are on the very citadel of the apostolic rock, not only has our Lord Jesus Christ redeemed you in common with all men, but the blessed apostle Peter has instructed you far beyond all men, through the same Christ our Lord. And that was Sermon 1 and 3 of Pope St. Leo the Great. Again, not to be confused with Pope Leo the Thirteenth. Leo the Thirteenth came many centuries later and has not been canonized. Pope Leo the Great is one of the greatest of the popes in the history of the Church, as his title suggests. <laughs> and here you see something very different than we see in our time. You see here a, a humble pontiff, a pontiff who is afraid for his own soul because he understands the weight of the cross he was given when he was named Pope. Something to consider, I think, for our time. Let me know what you thought of this in the comments, please. Like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. As does sharing this on social media. That helps a lot as well. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.